So uh, yeah, my name is Nathan Eggie. I'm from uh, Mozilla, and today I'll be talking to you about the DALA Video Codec Project, uh, what we are affectionately calling the next, next generation video. All right. And so um, I'll start by sort of giving the motivation of why free codecs matter. Um, and so here we're talking about, when we talk about free, we're talking about control and not, and not cost. So the idea is that um, you, know, you should be able to do anything with this video codec that you want to and apply it to any application that you want to and not have to ask permission from anybody. Um, and so if you look at the current video codecs, um, there are billion dollar toll tax on communication tools. So what this means is that you know, for every cell phone um, that has a audio or video codec in it, there's a small cost associated with you know, licensing that codec. And if you look at the price of the components of that, that device over time, they all go down, but the cost of licensing the codec sort of stays constant. Um, and of course, you know, as, as these things are sold all over the place, this is you know, multiplied a million fold. So um, there's a, a heavy cost there. Um, and if you look at also the, the licensing terms on these codecs, they're really used as kind of a competitive weaponry, right? So the um, commodity hardware manufacturers will use these weapons by having uh, patents on some portions of the codec, and they'll have a reciprocal license with other, other hardware vendors. And what this means is new entries into the market who don't have any of those advantages um, will have to pay a little bit more, you know, that few cents per device. And that will make them uncompetitive and unprofitable. And so this is a, a tool that you use to keep competitive markets, um, your, your competitors out of the market. And then finally, you know, the success of the internet was based on you know, not having to ask permission, right? So having to license a codec already is kind of burdensome. And if you have an idea beginning from that point, maybe a, a non-starter. Um, and of course, you know, if you, if you use it, you don't have to beg for, you know, beg for forgiveness either. So um, I work at Mozilla, and we ship a web browser you might have heard of. And we do this through a volunteer network. For, for many distros, we do this through this volunteer network of distributors, you know, people who run FTP sites, who host the source code, or who host binaries. Um, if you're a small open source project, and you're using a codec, and you're distributing through the same fashion, and, you know, we all have the same problem. We can't count how many people are using our, our products. So for many of these licenses, there's a per user cost. Um, and it's just even keeping track of the number of users is burdensome. And you can't possibly even begin to, to um, you know, pay that license cost. And so what a lot of people do is they'll just ignore these, these costs. Um, and for small projects, you know, you're perfectly fine doing so with the assumption that, you know, you're too small to be sued. But what happens is, once you're successful, then you become a target. And so, um, you know, a, a famous case is, is Skype, you know, started by using VP7 and VP8. And then when they became, you know, larger and successful, they, they had the revenue to then license other codecs like 264. Um, and so there's sort of this tax on success that, that shows up when you use, um, you know, codecs without being mindful of the licenses. And then finally, the, the cost of the license really isn't actually the largest cost in deployment. The largest cost is incompatibility. And you think about the life cycle of a uh, product for some hardware manufacturers, and they might spend orders of magnitude more on just ensuring <laughs> compatibility across all their devices and all their deployments. And the licensing fee then is, is really not so much uh, a, a concern. And so you might have seen this uh, web comic. And um, you know you think, well, okay, we have all these codecs. You know, we should really just make a new codec that that covers these use cases, and then we can get rid of all these compatibility issues. Um, and now you have one more codec that you have to be compatible with. So um, developing new codecs is kind of missing the point. You know, the, you know, the compatibility is kind of missing the point here. There, there are other really good reasons. And so um, you know, these are all mostly around um, cost and licensing. So the you know, you can't license uh, an encumbered codec if there's no acceptable license. So for, for certain video codecs, um, they might, if you call them to license their codec, they'll give you option A or option B. Um, and, you know, neither one of these things apply to you. So, you know, there's no acceptable way for you to even get a license. And an example of this is, you know, for uh, 264, if you are deploying this um, to a large group of people on the internet, there is a license cap, and so you can just pay the cap and don't have to worry about counting the number of people. But for other codecs like AAC, 
there's no cap, so you, you're back to the same kind of problem. There's no license that works for your, your distribution model. Um, and in some cases, you know, building a new codec then may be cheaper than, than the licensing terms. The DAL development team uh, within Mozilla is far below the, the cap for 264. So, um, and we, we're not sure what the licensing will look like for 265 exactly. So it makes sense for, for Mozilla, who has this distribution problem, to, to build a new or to invest in the development of this free codec that everybody then can use. Um, and of course, this adversarial licensing is a huge risk in a, in a competitive market. And um, you know, FRAN is often none of fair, reasonable, or non-discriminatory. Uh, there was an FTC hearing in June of 2011 where the intellectual property ad advisor for a large networking company you know, said that FRAN meant she had to call and sign an NDA before she could get licensing terms. And so you know, if she's under NDA, she can't talk to other people about their licensing terms for the same technologies. You know, how is this possibly you know, reasonable and non-discriminatory? All right, so what we're trying to do with DALA is we're trying to you know, change the competitive market here. Um, you know, creating good codecs is, is not an easy problem. Um, but we really don't need that many. We really just need, just need one. Um, and many of the, the best implementations are already free software. So if you look at um, the open source community, many of the commercial implement or many of the implementations of these commercial codecs are already um, open source software. You know, you can use them, and if you have any kind of deployment at scale, you have to go and license the appropriate patents, maybe. But they're already out there. X264 and, and other implementations work great. Um, and then, of course, network effects, you know, decide the the market. So there has not been a case where a royalty-free codec has taken over in a, in a particular niche um, that's then been displaced by a non-royalty, you know, by a royalty-bearing codec. And so for JPEG, there are lots of, you know, JPEG's a pretty old uh, video or uh, image standard. There are lots of new image standards that have come out. Some of them, you know, have been patent encumbered and, and perhaps offer better performance in some very specific cases, but no, nobody's been able to displace JPEG. Um, but being royalty-free, you know, is not enough. There are different people who care about um, different things. There are some, for, for in the video space, there are people that care about um, the, the cost per bit in terms of the um, you know, number of, of uh, bits per pixel, say, the, the, the compression um, of the codec. But they don't care about price, right? Like, so they'll be willing to pay anything. You know, they want, just give me the very best codec. I'll pay whatever your licensing terms are. There are people who are in the mobile space that say, well, I need the best performance per, per watt. Um, there are people that, that have other needs. And so in order to really kind of win this game, be, you, know, you have to be royalty free and you have to be good on all fronts. And so at Ziff, we um, shipped other codecs. We shipped Theora and we shipped Vorbis. And uh, these were not best in, the, in class for those use cases at that time. And they didn't see the great adoption, even though they were royalty free. And in some cases, you know, they were significantly better. And so um, what we did at Ziff is we then made Opus. So Opus is an example of a royalty-free audio codec uh, that we did with um, at the IETF uh, standard body. And Opus is better almost across the board for every, every use case. And it basically um, made like 10 other codecs obsolete. You could just use Opus in one place, and you could handle all, all use cases from you know, very low quality uh, voice communication all the way up to low latency, high quality stereo, um, um, high bit, bit depth uh, music quality. And so what we want to do is the same sort of thing. Um, but the strategy is, is essential here. So um, th these things are, are necessary for us to be successful in deploying a royalty-free video codec. So we need to design alternatives to, the, to, to avoid the, the worst uh, patent thicket. So it's not enough to be just avoiding existing known patents, you know, working around them. We have to actually have a story that's compelling that we can tell people about why we're royalty free. So just going in and saying, well, we read these patents and we navigated them, you know, isn't, isn't sufficient because those people aren't going to also read those patents, you know, the people you're talking to you know, who, who may use your technology. They don't want to invest the time in that. Um, and so we have to have a compelling story. Uh, we'll, we'll read and analyze patents and publish the results. And often, 
you know, the advice there is that you, know, you should not publish your patent analysis because it kind of gives your competitors a blueprint of how you might um, you know, defend this in, in say, uh, patent court. And the, the point there is that we, when we analyze and publish these results, we can then defend ourselves against IPR claims like we did, did it with Opus by simply pointing at specific parts of these defenses and saying, you know, your patent, you know, your, your claims to this technique we're using do not apply for this specific reason. And we're not actually giving away any patent defense as a result. You know, we end up with a very defensible statement. And then, of course, we're going to patent a new technology we develop. We've done this already with DALA. Um, and the idea there is, is that by patenting um, specific technologies, we can then go to other partners in the industry and get them to um, listen to our claims as to why we believe we're royalty free. Until Opus had um, patents, it was, a very, it was very difficult to have that conversation. But towards the end of the Opus development, we filed some patents, and we were able then to speak with industry partners. Because we can take those patents, and we can use them to kind of uh, grant reciprocal licenses. So the, the fourth bullet point here, um, which is sort of what we did with Opus, is we, we partnered with other people in the industry and granted a license on a reciprocal term, which meant that you could use our patents um, for deployment of Opus, so long as you did not sue anybody else who was deploying Opus um, for those patents. And then if, if you did go after someone else who was deploying Opus, you would lose that defense. And any of the other players who were, or partners who were deploying Opus who wanted to sue you then had the right to do that without losing their license. And so this became a lot sort of like the, the GPL in a sense. You know, it became this sort of uh, technique to encourage um, good behavior. And then finally, you know, we're targeting the, the next next generation. So we're not targeting 265. We're looking after that. The codec development cycle um, is a pretty long cycle. And so we believe that to be competitive, we need to take the time to actually develop something that is significantly better than 265 um, because they've already kind of come to market. So if we were to deploy something that was equal to that, they may have an advantage in the hardware space or in other spaces. And so we want to actually be maybe 30 to 50% better than what 265 is doing. And then finally, you know, we have to document all of this stuff and make it so that it's you know, abundantly clear um, that DAL is royalty free, that DAL is better in, in all these use cases, um, and let people know what we're, what we're all about. All right. Um, and so there are other parts of the strategy that are actually going to be very difficult. So we have to be the best in all cases. We have to be best in um, compression per bit, in um, bit per, per watt, so for the mobile case. We have to be good for archive use cases. We have to be good for streaming. We have to be good for um, real-time communication. We have to be able to speak with our competitors and our critics in the other camps and get them on board with what we're doing. So there's a huge amount of develop developers that work on royalty-bearing codecs. And there's great mindshare on that stuff. And we want to encourage those people that to contribute parts of their technology towards the codec development process knowing that they can get the benefit of using this on a royalty-free basis once, it's, once it becomes available, say, after the next generation of codecs. Um, and then one of the strategies that, was, that we did um, with Opus that was great was we found a niche that was not currently covered by existing audio codecs. And we developed a strong use case around that with Opus. So for uh, low latency, high quality, um, audio, there was nothing in that space. And Opus sort of filled that niche. And until we started showing that we were very successful there, we couldn't get other people to become interested in Opus. But once we showed some success, then everybody realized that this was going to be something they could deploy. Um, and then finally, the biggest problem is we, you know, the DAL development team is, is 10 people, and we're not in a position to develop our own hardware. And so what we'd like to do is create technology in a way that Shows to be, you know, shows that it's compelling, but also is something that other people will want to pick up and can easily convert into a hardware implementation. And so, um, you know, some of the things that we did in Opus that worked really well that we're going to try to do with DALA is we're going to try to do all of our work in a public process um, and in a recognized standards body with a strong IPR disclosure policy. So the work with Opus was done at the IETF 
And in the IETF, there is a strong IPR disclosure policy where anybody who shows up to contribute, that is, make any comment towards that process for developing that standard, is required to disclose any patents they have or may know about that read on that standard. And in that specific disclosure, they're required to give the patent number. And this is good, you know, it, it's not, there's, there's nothing about the ITF policy that says you must not use patent encumbered ideas or technologies, but because they give us a specific patent number, we can then evaluate that patent and say, well, we do or do not agree that this, you know, IP infringes on what we're doing, and if we do believe that it does, we can work around it. We can then just opt to use some other technology or find some different way of doing things. Um, that, that worked very well in, uh, with Opus. And then, you know, we're going to question all of the assumptions around the conventional structure of video codecs. So, you know, basically, uh, the Dahl Research Project is sort of a high risk, high reward approach. We're going to try new and radical techniques uh, with the idea that um, some of them should, should give us performance gains that are above and beyond what you get with traditional video techniques. Um, the way 264 and 265 and VP8 and VP9 have been developed, they're sort of incremental improvements. So you take an existing technique and you say, well, now we have more CPU budget. What can we do that's different? And maybe you'll refine that technique a little bit. And by applying you know, a little more computational power, you'll get better motion vectors or you'll get better um, uh, entropy coding. And so we're going to chuck all those out and see where we can find something else. Uh, we're going to try to find applications where high flexibility is essential. So we've targeted DALA at uh, real-time communication. This is in line with um, the work with Opus, where at the IETF, they adopted Opus for the mandatory to implement audio codec. We would like to develop a codec that fits, a video codec that fits that niche for real-time communication uh, with the hope that that will eventually get used um, at the ITF with, with the WebRTC. And then finally, you know, um, the process at MPEG uses a PSNR to select the features they include in their codecs. And PSNR, you know, doesn't actually correlate well with what people perceive as video quality. And so, we actually will look at the videos and choose our techniques according to what gives a better visual performance rather than just arbitrary met metrics. OK. And so very quickly, I'm going to give you guys an overview on how video codecs work. Um, so there are four main parts to uh, video codecs that pretty much all codecs are, ha have to do. Uh, there's prediction, you know, considering what you already know about a scene when coding the current scene. Um, transformation, so you rearrange all the data so that it's in a more compact form. Quantization, um, lowering the resolution of the transform data, and then entropy coding. And so prediction, there are two kinds of prediction in video codecs. There's intra-prediction, where you predict portions of the current frame from already decompressed portions of that frame, so lower in the frame you can use references from above it. And then inter-prediction, where you use the decoded previous frame to predict the next frame. And here you can see, you know, for this current frame, um, we've constructed a reference frame from the previous frames, and that's the residual. And, and there's significantly less information in the residual. And so that's how most video codecs get the bulk of their, their compression. Um, we do transformation. So most codecs use a 2D DCT, which takes, you know, some spatial domain or some image, image information, image pixels, applies the transform into a more sparse domain, keeps just the highest coefficients, and uses those as um, what it codes. This gives us a, also great, great compression, is responsible for some of the blocky edges you see in, in codecs like JPEG. Um, and then the last two points, you know, quantization and coding. Quantization is where we, um, you know, we'll take those transform coefficients, reduce the number of bits we use to represent them, and take those bits and uh, run them through an entropy coder that converts them into some um, set of numbers that has some probability distribution that's efficient. And so in DALA, we're going to basically do different things for all of those. Um, instead of doing just a DCT, we apply a lap transform, um, which is technology that was around about 20 years ago in the early 90s that was abandoned because of the computational cost. And now that we've got um, you know, faster computers, this is now something that is tractable. It also requires us to go through and do a bunch of other new techniques because none of the intra-prediction and inter-prediction work with lap transforms exactly the same way. And 
um, you know, we've had to then innovate in that, in that area. Um, we're going to do multi-symbol arithmetic coding. Um, most of the existing codecs do binary arithmetic coding, uh, context-adaptive binary arithmetic coding. Um, we use this great um, technique we borrowed from Opus called perceptual vector quantization. And if you were at FOMS yesterday, Jean-Marc gave a great talk describing that technique and why we believe that's um, going to work really well for us. And there's some interesting ideas around prediction where um, you no longer do the difference between frames. And in doing so, that removes um, our exposure to a number of patents that begin by saying, take, take the difference of two frames and then do this additional processing. Um, finally, we do um, chroma from Luma prediction, which, which uh, is different from other codecs. And um, Tim Terrybear will be talking about overlap block motion compensation next month at a conference. And we do this clever time frequency resolution switching. So all of these are kind of new techniques that are not currently used um, for video coding. Um, and we're going to use these in DAW to try to, you know, have a believable story for being royalty free. Um, if you'd like to follow the work we're doing, I've got um, a link here to some of the demos we put together. These are all online, and I think the slides are online that have, has a link. Um, I encourage you to take a look at them if you have any interest in those specific um, coding techniques. Uh, this is a chart that we made that sort of describes our, our progress for the previous year. And so what you're looking at here, the red line is um, what H.265 does on a certain video set as of, I believe, November uh, 20th of last year. And then these lines here are, are the DALA code base sort of over time. And so we're making progress. You know, there's been additional work, actually. John Mark landed code yesterday that, that gave another 5% improvement at sort of low rates. So we're moving closer to that red line of 265. And we believe that there are many more techniques we can apply that, that will get us a little closer. Um, and of course, you know, the techniques I talked about before are really, you know, not the end of it. There's new and innovative work that's being done in this space. And for example, this is a very interesting technique that lets you take the center frame that is a composite of the two other images and separate them. So these are the result of doing sort of spatial or the, the sparsely induced prediction where you're actually able to separate two frames that were overlaid. Um, and that, that this has computational cost that you know, maybe tractable, you know, in, in the next few years. So there are ideas that are new that haven't been currently deployed that we believe we can get a lot of gains out of. So what's the road ahead look like? Um, you know, as that slide showed, we've been, we've been making some progress with these new techniques. We've had to sort of innovate and um, find new ways to, to work around problems introduced by using lap transforms, but there's still a long way to go. Um, the industry is currently looking at deploying 265, uh, HEVC, which is 265, and, and VP9. Um, so they're not really focused on the next, next generation. They've got a lot of work ahead of them. But we'd like to you know, take that opportunity to, to innovate and, and make DALA something that will be competitive. So uh, we'd love to get help from people. And we, in particular, are looking for application domains where um, you know, there's some novel, novel use case that isn't currently covered by video codecs. And if there's something that you think would be interesting, maybe around um, you know, video conferencing or, or any of those areas, please talk to us and let us know. We'd like to accommodate that. All right, so I'm open for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So we have time for one or two questions. So first up, let's see. Uh, are you going to, to propose the data to a standard body when it's uh, finished? Uh, absolutely. In fact, we're going to be working with the standards body hopefully before we oh, I'm sorry so to repeat the question um, the question was will we be um, proposing DALA to a standards body at completion and the answer to that is that we're actually talking with um, the ITF and forming a working group hopefully soon to do development of video codecs in a public process so even before we have you know this is just one of the ideas um, even before we've gotten everything finalized we'd love to engage a standards body maybe bring in other partners to give us uh, contributions may involve the community um, and get that done long before we're complete. Um, you want to match uh, ACM X265, uh, but uh, what about um, well the uh, CPU usage? Because the X260, uh, 265 is really heavy, both on right. 
Right, yeah, so we, we run tests against, two, so the question was, how does the CPU usage of DALA compare to 265? Uh, we, we run uh, benchmarks against 265, and currently we, are, we run significantly faster than them um, on their reference model. Uh, our goal is to develop not just a reference model, but also a production quality uh, code that we can release you know, under the Ziff Mozilla heading that could be used to actually do this in software um, at a performant rate, you know, from day one. We're not going to, you know, just have ideas that will be, you know, hope that the CPU performance will improve over time. So we, we're, we're designing techniques that make use of this. Our entropy coder, for example, is designed to work really well with Cindy. So does it mean that you're closer to X around 264? Um, no, I, I think the techniques we're using have not been finalized. There's a, a lot of optimization we have not done. So the X264 has gone through and done assembly translations of some of the transformations and, and uh, motion search, and we haven't done anything like that at all. So there's still lots of room for additional performance. Okay. So we'll stop here. Thank you very much, and congratulations. Okay, thank you. You did, you did a full room. <laughs> so maybe next year we need a bigger room. Hopefully. Right, so the next talk will be...